it's the next level. When the cold comes for you, the blood stops running to your limbs. It pulls up inside to keep your organs warm. My first love told me that. An offshore roughnecker he was. Tall and lean and tough as wet leather. He'd say, Ruthie, your smile keeps me warm, so be sure to wear it till I'm home. Hey, Pamers, welcome to the show. I'm Steve. And I'm Daphne. And this is going to be a spoiler full podcast of the second episode of Snowpiercer Season 3. Daphne, why don't you give us our title and our synopsis? All right. The title of the episode is The Last to Go. And the synopsis is Leighton goes on a, the hunt as Wilfred works to boost morale. The resistance discovers a threat that could undermine everything they've worked for. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this was a great episode. I, uh, I I really enjoyed it. You know, the first episode was good and it's it, they're building up and I've got I've got some stuff in my notes that I want to talk about um, when we get there about the how we have this. It's almost like we have an episode of the week, like we have a problem. We have an A story, a B story. But then we've got all these other uh, the, the the serialized part of it. As the well. ongoing pieces. Yeah. There's ongoing things that are, they're trying to get us to the end result, but there are also these little obstacles that come up that they have to deal with as well that also drive the story forward. So there's a lot going on in this episode. I thought it was great. It advanced things a bit. There were some things I hadn't considered mm -hmm. that we'll talk about. And I feel like we got some some victories for Team Layton in this episode. Some things happened and some of the things that went on or some of the issues actually helped the situation on the other train. So I feel like we're in a great spot heading into two episode three. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see where they're going to go. I, I'm, I'm glad we kind of, the story definitely moved along, but it's something that occurred to me about, because Laura and I were talking about this with The Witcher as well, that there's this like monster of the week or this problem of the week episode, but there's also that underlying, there's the other long range story that's going on. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, you know, it, it's it's something that, that TV has they've started to figure out a merge of the episodic and the serialized to where yeah. you, you got like in, in the eighties we have, everything was episodic. You, you didn't have anything serialized. Um, and then I, I want to say the, the X-Files came along and really the X-Files was probably the first, uh, at least for me anyway, the first show that really explored a nighttime serialized adult show that wasn't a, uh, wasn't a, Soap opera. Yeah. And, and, but even, even the X-Files didn't really, cause they would have their monster of the week episode and then they would have two or three that were part of the bigger picture. They didn't really often meld those two together. Yeah. And I think the two what, together. Yeah. I think what we're starting to see now in television, at least in these kind of shows is we're starting to see them figure out how to meld. We can have a monster of the week or a problem of the week episode and so i've got that in my notes that i want to talk about that when we when we get there i'm kind of excited when we get to that that point all right well i'm wondering what you've got for the problem of the week because there were a few things going on but only one of them was probably a an actual problem mm -hmm. yeah it was it was the big and we'll get to that we'll, we'll get to that one as well because that's uh that was a uh an interesting problem and an interesting solution that they came up with so yeah well with that we should probably go ahead and get into our top five discussion points and uh, it's 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 not going to get old, me saying every time, the lady will go first. <laughs> All right. Well, my first point, I have to say this because I actually cheered at when this happened. We were right, Steve. Wilfred has had, at the time, no idea that Ruth was still on the train. <laughs> 
Now, by the end of the episode, that had changed. However, you could see Javi was really surprised when he saw her. What? You're not supposed to be here. You're on the other train. That wasn't the situation at all. Ruth has been there the whole time in the bowels of the train leading the resistance efforts. And we knew that. Mm -hmm. I, I and now Wilford does. But yeah. I am glad that we were right. We knew this. We knew that he had no idea she was she was there. And I was like, but I, I loved his reaction too, to the point that it was almost the only time we've really seen him fall back. Cause it was almost, cause his, his reaction was really quite good where he said, Oh, and basically it, like it dawned on me. He said, I should have known that it was someone yes. who knew the inner workings of the train. Like he yes. should have known that's who was the person in charge. And I had this in my notes. I was a little confused at, because on the second time I watched it, it, it almost sounded like there was some sort of code between Javi and, and uh, Zara, uh, right? Zara, yeah, Zara is the one that's on Snow, on uh, Wilford's train. Or is it? Yes, yeah, Zara. Zara. Between yes. Uh, Zara and Javi, where she's trying to talk to him and he's refusing to talk to him until she says, engineer, Mr. Wilford needs you up train. And then it's all of a sudden like there was this shift in his demeanor to where he changed his mind. He grabbed his bag. And then he had that whole final data collection story made up for Kevin when Kevin asked him, you know, what are you doing here? And he's like, oh, final data collection kind of thing. So I thought Javi maybe already knew that Ruth was there. But like you said, obviously he did not know because he says, you're on, aren't you on the other train? So I was, that whole sequence kind of confused me a, a little bit, um, I think he knew he was going to meet with someone who was leading the resistance. I don't think he knew it was her. Okay. I'm not sure who he thought he was going to be meeting with because it seemed like he thought the main leaders of the resistance were on the other train. So, yeah, I'm wondering if he expected somebody else like Pike or... Okay. Uh, yeah. That that would make sense. That would make me understand then her use her him only reacting when she used that particular phrase. And or on the other hand, and this is another thought I had, it could be I don't know if the dog knows phrases, but that could be the phrase that the dog is not going to attack him for getting up. That if the dog hears engineer, hears I don't know, that's probably I don't know dog stuff. So, but <laughs> anyway, that, so, uh, okay. So that was your first one. Just the, the, all that stuff yes. about Ruth and, and, uh, not yeah, I think it's cool that we got to see Ruth kind of in this, I mean, she really, in the end of the episode, she sacrificed her freedom for the sake of everyone else on the train, because we know, and she said this, she's loyal to something bigger. Yeah. And I think that that really came to a head this week because she knew in order for them to be able to take care of that EMP machine, she was going to have to buy them some time. Yeah. The only way that she could do that is to go out there and run interference, which really meant being captured. Yeah. And I, yeah. She's looking out for the that. rest of the yeah. train. I, I've got some more about that later, but I, I love you brought that up. The, the loyal thing. Because these two episodes have really, and I think that's going to be, that's uh, obviously going to be a running theme, is the the issue of loyalty, is who are you loyal to? And even to the wedding, the wedding was called the loyal wedding. Yeah. Not the royal wedding, the loyal wedding. And I thought, I, it was kind of strange on the second watch. I was like, huh? Oh, I get it. Because Wilford's all about loyalty, but it's being loyal to him. Is the yes. thing. Even though he doesn't want to say that. He says, he, he, he. Uh, equates loyalty to the train with loyalty to him. To him, yes. Because he's power crazy. I mean, we know this about him. He doesn't look at that wedding thinking, oh, LJ's getting married, how wonderful that is. He's thinking, what can I milk from it mm -hmm. to how demonstrate I... yeah. that I'm allowing or creating these experiences and they should be loyal to me? How can it buy me more support? Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. And I thought it was clever, too, that they used a rat in the pipes to communicate. 
I had that in my notes. I had that in my notes. I had seriously a rat. You've been able to train a rat. <laughs> to, Why not? I guess it's possible. They had six <laughs> months. So, okay. They did. I'll, they I'll... worked it out. I'm down with the rat. <laughs> I'm down with the rat. Okay. All right. I I'm... still, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it. And I think, you know, even the Pike and Ruth exchanges and communications and dialogue has been a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to see where it goes now that she's, well, we're not sure what's going on with her right now. Cause... Yeah, she's locked in some sort of <laughs> cell. I, don't, I couldn't tell where that cell was at, whether it was in somewhere in first class or whether it was down in the bowels. I, I wasn't sure. So it, it will be interesting I to see. Don't, yeah, I don't think it's as cold as where she was. So oh, that's yeah. probably a good thing. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, okay, so my first one is uh, I want to talk a little bit about Asha. The new, the new yes. character, Archie Punjabi. Um, you know, she's a, she she gives this story to Leighton that there was seventy four of them. They were all career scientists. Thirty four. There were thirty four. Thirty four. Okay, I misheard it. Thirty four, not seventy four. Okay, that's that's a better number. Thirty four. Um, but it was they were career scientists, but they also had their families with them. And then she says that uh, several were killed by marauders until the marauders died off. And then her nephew was the last one to die almost four years ago, right? And I couldn't tell if Leighton was believing her story or if he was just letting her explain as much as she could. Because this makes me wonder if, is it possible there could be more survivors out there? Uh, how did these marauders survive, at least for the, the years that they did, until the cold finally took them? You know, uh, how did she survive there by herself? It, you know, it was so I wonder if that's going to be a, a story that we're going to get kind of doled out slowly over the season or if this is all we're gonna, ever going to get with it. She gave us a little information. I mean, like you said, she she's a career scientist or um, she's a nuclear tech. I thought it was sad that she said her 15 year old nephew was the last one to go because she said, in addition to the scientists and the technicians at this plant, some of the families were there. And it was after, you know, he came down with thyroid cancer and he was begging her to kill him. And after he passed, she just kind of lost track of time. She lost hope. And it was like someone other than her was living there. So I get the impression she had like this outside looking in. Interesting. Vision. And also. Of herself. Also, she knew about Wilford in Snowpiercer. Because as soon as, as he says, we're from Snowpiercer, she says, well, where's Wilford, the great engineer? So obviously it was, it was well known over the world that Wilford, and obviously it had to be because he's building this huge train that's going to travel all over the world in a way for people to get away from the cold. So it, it, it just was interesting to me that we've, we've encountered someone who knows of Wilford, but doesn't know about him, like doesn't know what kind of maniac he is, doesn't know all these things, but she knows, oh, the great the great engineer who built this train that was going to save humanity is still alive. And then, you know, Leighton has to break it to her that, well, you know, we haven't really evolved as, as much as you thought. As much as, as you'd, you'd hope. Yeah, as much as you'd hope. Um, I also love that in that story or in that, that exchange, we get confirmation of a timeline, which we have not gotten before. No, we haven't. They said eight years. Yeah. Eight years. And she survived four of that with nobody. With nobody. Yeah. Yeah, we know it's been eight years since the big collapse and everything froze over. And I wonder if we're going to see some PTSD from her from that loneliness of those four years. I would think so, too. And, and of the attacks by the Marauders, like, I hope they give us a little bit of that so we can kind of get to see her in a different way, not just the way she is now, but how she started. Yeah. And I thought it was really interesting after um, Josie sets up that room for her to sleep in, mm -hmm. she goes in and she's kind of touching things. And then she takes the plant out of, she takes the soil out and smells it and then pulls the plant right out of the soil. I don't think she just did that on a whim or that it's something that we just forget. 
I think it's something that may come into play later. Like she knows something that is going to come into play. We just don't know what it is. I think like Leighton, she's a valuable commodity because she survived outside all this time. And she's something, you know, to hold on to. He, she could be coming very handy down the road. Yeah. So I think it's good. I totally agree. And I, I, I was so confused by that part. I couldn't figure out what she was doing and what was going on there. So th they definitely got to come back to that of her saying something about the soil or, and, cause I don't know if those are samples that they've all, they've always had, or if they were, those are new samples or, or what. So, uh, yeah, that's going to be interesting to see. Yeah, it was just plants in a plant pot that was in the room. And I'm just like, okay. Um, and then she just dug into it and pulled the plant out. And again, I question, is she someone that's going to come into play for the season or beyond? Because like you said, talking about serializing plus the monster of the week we know that Wilfred is kind of the monster of the week, or he's the ongoing threat. Then there are little things that happen as well, but there's also the long-term goal for them to get somewhere where they can recolonize. Yeah. And it has to be a warmer climate. They haven't been able to find it yet, but they have one more spot to check. So that was, that was my first point. What's, uh, what's your next one? Okay, so my next one... I have to talk about the wedding of the year. This is one of mine as well. So I'm excited to talk about it. Let's get into it. <laughs> <laughs> this could be like a multi-point thing because there's a few things that happen in it. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to try to stick to the wedding itself. Okay. Because we've already talked a little bit about the fact that Wilford, when he realized that they were going to getting married, he, he you could see his wheels were already turning on how he can use this to his advantage and build up his stature even more. Because I think he just wants people to see him as a provider. He can provide, he can take things away. I mean, he basically eliminated the class system and said, you're all going to work from now on. It's not going to be, you know, all the easy stuff that you're used to. You're going to be digging in the compost. You're going to be doing other work, fixing things, sewing, all of this stuff. And it's just, he eliminated that, I think, as a punishment and a reminder to everyone that he can giveth and he can taketh away. But in this respect, we I want to start really with Oz setting up the red light and the music. And LJ comes in and he just wants to soak in the moment for a moment. And he tells her, it's a mean old world, but with you in it, it finally makes sense. And then he gets down on one knee and proposes to her with the biggest diamond probably left in existence that was only the cost of a pair of heavy socks. I've got that quote in my quotes, so. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that that was charming. And then I, but then you also have to remember who they are. LJ is a killer and he Ugh. he's not a lot better than her, but I, he's not, I mean, they're not the, the cream of the crop. They've done some pretty terrible things. Oh yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah. So I, last, last episode, I was starting to sympathize with LJ a little bit. And then I remembered, wait a minute, she didn't just kill people. She like cut them, cut things off from men. And she yes. was, it was, and and then in this episode, we kind of see that come out a little bit again of her of Oz realizing that, hey, you're you're crazy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but it's still... our wedding day. Do you ever stop conniving? Yeah. Yeah. And he's still in love with her, though. And I absolutely love that proposal scene. I, it was just uh, I was it was perfect. And the, the, unfortunately, that was the only thing that Oz ended up having power over in this in this wedding. You know? Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. It was interesting when they went to tell Wilford and he was like, I'll give people the night off. And Zara suggested extra rations. And he's talking about a red velvet Leia cake and they drag the cake maker out of his job in compost. 
so he can make the cake, to which he was eternally grateful to get to leave. He's like, give him a shower and let him let him make a cake and whatever he needs. And he's just, just like, thank you, thank you, thank you. So you can tell that he's been through a lot in in that job. Yeah, yeah. Well, we um, know that compost job is not is not a fun no, it's not a fun it job. is not a fun and one. Isn't it interesting? I, well, di- I'll digress for a minute here. Isn't it interesting that in the first episode, we have this big deal made out of people having baths and we open yeah. this episode with Wilford in a bath. And that was <laughs> the most awkward thing. I really, you look at Kevin and he's totally fine with it doesn't bother him in the least bit. <laughs> and Dr. Hedwood is like... <laughs> Dr. Hedwood is just like not wanting anything to do with it. I mean, and Wilfred is singing. Like he's singing while they're in the room it's with him. So creepy. And then... Uh... You know, ain't no sunshine till she's gone. And, and it just... He's just so creepy. He doesn't have to do anything and he's creepy now because of everything that we've seen him do. And there's one thing he does in this episode. <laughs> Going back. I I'll, was speechless. I'll help you out because it's in my, <laughs> this is what was, this was what was my next, my was going to be in my next talking, my next discussion point about, uh, it, it kind of revolves around the wedding is the fact that, that, you know, Wilford's got his hooks into into Lila. She considers him his father figure now that her father is gone. Mm-hmm. And then he goes to Oz and that's just a, a such a creepy conversation where he sits down next to him and he's touching his back and he's touching his neck. And then he then the whole nut grabbing scene was just oh, the worst. Man. And I know that that uh Ola has got the worst of that that confrontation because you just see him after Wilford Lee's he's still doubled over and just in pain but the whole thing was just so creepy and awkward I mean it was worse than the Negan nut tapping thing from oh the my goodness Dead, yes which was which was creepy and awkward itself but this is just next level and Sean Bean I mean he played it so well that it's just like I mean I it's such a it's just a great acting job from him as for a horrible, creepy, awkward scene that, yes. that happened. Um but yeah, and it's just he, he asks him too after he's like Well, and let's let's state the let's go all the way. He didn't just grab Oz's balls. He made Oz grab, grab his. his. Yeah. Oh. And he was trying to prove a point. That even though Oz is artistic and he does such a wonderful job on the piano, you know, he had a different job as a brakeman and he had done some really tough things, some bad things because Wilford went and read Roche's file on him. And I'm thinking, oh, Mr. Roche, I miss you this season. (laughs) Yes. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. You know, just when we thought, and this was a thing that occurred to me just now as we've been talking about this, just when we thought Oz, again, like I said, I was starting to sympathize with LJ a little bit. I was, Mm -hmm. I had start, I had gotten to the point with Oz where I thought, okay, he's kind of redeemed himself. He's kind of brought himself back from being this nasty brakeman who was making, getting sexual favors for, from people. And it was in that first season to where he's grown to now to where it's almost like Wilford's trying to pull him back to the dark side mm-hmm. to where I think he is. He says, you know, what are your hands for? And he says, my hands are for crushing nuts. And he says, and caressing your wife. And I, again, another creepy exchange, uh, but still, and if there's anything left after that, he can, you know, t- tinkle the piano, I guess. Yeah. Twinkle, something like that yeah, with the piano. Then, yeah. Oh, it just, it was, it was horrible and awkward and I, I felt bad for Oz. And so I'm, I'm wondering what we're going to see, how that's going to change him. If he really is. Well, gonna... he knew he had to go through it, through with it. He couldn't back out because Wilford had already made all of these grand plans. And he even talks to LJ and says, I, really wanted something small. It didn't need to be this elaborate. 
But that little bit of her that's still, I mean, look at how she lit up when she saw the ring. There is that bit inside her that is still the a princess girl. who wants yeah, to be princess. a queen. Yeah. Yeah, she wants to be the queen. She wants to rule because she even tells him that, like, we can rule this whole train when the time comes. And she said, the older people are dying off and we're the youngest and we can rule. And she loves that Wilford looks at her like a daughter. And and I think he's proud of her as a daughter figure. Oh, Because she does exactly what he wants. Mm -hmm. She's ruthless and devious exactly what yeah. he wants in a daughter is... and alex disappointed him mm -hmm. exactly exactly this is the daughter that he wanted this is when he lost melanie yeah. when he lost alex now he has lj so yep and Ugh. he loves her he's building her up in his image and he didn't really have to work hard because she was already pretty dastardly to begin with um so let's see the only other thing i had in that in that kind of area, general area about the wedding and stuff was when he comes in again, it's still just creepy when he bounces on the bed and he makes some crack about what they'll be doing on the bed. That was just a, another creepy kind of, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, so that, that included mine in with yours. What's, uh, what's your next one? I think you're number three. Okay. So I feel like we have to talk and this isn't a real long point, but it's something that was alluded to in this episode. And it makes me question a few other things. Influenza. Okay. So during, the, I guess, the six months, there was an outbreak of influenza that killed the male Dr. Hedwood. Okay. Because she was holding on to his boots. When Wilfred gave the speech, he mentions the influenza and those that were lost. And now I'm wondering who else may have died in that outbreak because there are people we haven't seen. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. I was so totally confused. I didn't under, when he said that the Dr. Hedwood was gone, the male Dr. Head was gone. Uh, and she's like, well, it's like, he's still with us. And I was like, did we see him die? I don't remember. No, and then we he, didn't. When he says the line about influenza, I didn't know if he was, if he was trying to, like lessen the loss of the first class passengers, you know, those hundreds that died. I thought they, is he, has he kind of spun it to where he made people believe, but I think, I think you're right now, the way, the way he said it and the way it was, it was alluded to, I think you're right. I think sometime during this six months, they had an outbreak of influenza that took mm -hmm. several of our, of our characters that, that explains so much to me now that I was confused about uh, before. Yeah. So. Because people are missing, like, mm -hmm. I'm just curious as to where they are. I mean, we know like the doctor is alive, but there was another doctor that had been helping them as well. Where is he? Yeah. He's the one who used to manage everyone at that was put in the drawers. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen him yeah. in a little bit. You're right. You're right. We and seen... uh, yeah. So Till's former lover who ran that. She was in the first, I think she wasn't she in the first, those first class cars that got swept away mm -mm. okay no oh. she was not okay. she's mia like yeah she's yeah. disappeared no one really knows where she is or at least they they're just not talking about her i mean she could be in the compost area for all i know and but there's a lot I of tailies there's a yeah. lot of tailies that we haven't seen we've seen lights we've seen winnie we've seen pike but there's a lot of tailies that we still haven't uh Yes, I haven't seen either. So yeah, that's some be of our regular folks. I'm 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 curious about where they are. Like the last Australian. It's another one. You're right. You're right. I don't think that he died. So not, yeah, not in the revolution or not in the rebellion. Yeah, we haven't. So yeah, there's a bunch that we've not. The the piano guy, right? The the piano tuner guy. We haven't seen him. Yeah. So there are people. Yeah. So I just have questions. Who else died? So it just made me think, is this why we haven't seen some of them? Have they, you know, has something happened? Is it the flu now? I mean, he's alluding to influenza. So now I'm just wondering, okay, well, maybe it was the flu that killed them. So I'm not sure. Um, so my next one is, is again, it's another short, kind of short one is, uh, I'm Alex, um, uh, 
she's back to not believing that Melanie is alive, not believing that the world is going to warm. She's lost, lost her hope again. And I was, it bothered me a little bit. And so I, I started to think about the fact that she's still a teenager and she's, yeah, she's, she's gonna, very young. She's going to go back and forth between, and people are going to have to convince her that convince her to hold on to that hope. You know, we saw Tilda yeah. in the last episode. Um, ben is trying to do it in this in this episode, but he's not really convincing very. He's not very. He's not as good at it as Till was. Is the thing because he's got his own worries that we'll get into in my next point when I talk about the serialized things that Ben's got things that he's worrying about. But it just it was a little. It, it seemed a little wishy washy. Like I said, until I, I realized that she's still a teenager and she's still gonna gonna go back and forth on these things yeah there's there's a lot it's a lot that she's having to deal with and i think it was reassuring for ben to remind her you know don't give up hope he's trying to get her to connect with that piece of herself and just realize that not all is lost that the work that they're doing is important and there are things that they can still solve and I, I mean, I was feeling like, are they going to find anything? Is there going to be any reason that if they go back, that Leighton can even remotely take the train back? Because I just, yeah, I'm just not sure. Yeah. But yeah. now I'm much more hopeful because there were things that happened at the end of this episode that really gave me a lot of hope. Yeah, and I'm trying to figure out. So I, I'm trying to figure out exactly how because I know we saw that that Big Alice had uh, some sort of coupling mechanism that she was able to couple up to Snowpiercer, and yes, uh, and then and then when they broke off, what I finally kind of figured out was they they basically from what I what I think is Big Alice basically reversed direction. So she's not pushing the train because remember, Big Alice was at the back of the train and Snowpiercer mm -hmm. was the front. And so they broke off the front. However many – we're still not totally sure on how many cars they have because they, they haven't called out how many cars they have. But they must have started taking Big Alice in the other direction, pulling the train because they said the EMP was all the way in the back of the train. What yes. Is, what is now the back of the train. So the geography is going to be an interesting – Thing to yeah, how, how it they're is. able to couple these, how they're able to take the train back. Are they going to just abandon the the nine the pirate Snowpiercer? I don't think so. I, I, I don't think so. I can't there's too much. There's too much valuable knowledge in those books, as we learned in this episode. So I can't. I don't think that they can just abandon it. So they've got to figure out a way to get the two trains back together together you know. and i think that they will i just think that it's not their priority at this moment i think that maybe that's something they're going to focus on just because they've run out of food but they have to figure that out because they've got to keep going yeah yeah well there's got you know, we, Layton, we, we've yeah, got to get back Layton's together very focused on that because he keeps saying yeah. we're going to take our train back we're going to take our train back and so yes. it, that's going to be an interesting dilemma to, to figure out how do they, how do they couple the, how do they get the trains back together? You know, maybe there's something to where each car has a link, has a way to link back together. I, I don't, if it gets. I think so. I think that that is the situation. I think that the cars do link together and it's just, they're going to have to get the logistical pieces of that worked out so that they can do it. Well, especially now I, that they have a hole, they have a hole in the back. So, yeah, because part I of that door though, got looked like part of that door got ripped off when the EMP went out of it. Yeah, such a wonderful thing to see. <laughs> Solved a few problems. Yes, took yes. care of a few things. I yeah. I I I've got some I've got some thoughts on that. As well. <laughs> <laughs> when we, when we I get... do I do as well. I thought it was interesting that Ruth referred to. Big Alice's side of the train as Wilfred's train. So I think we should stick with that. I know last week we were talking about, is it Big Alice? Is it Snowpiercer? Snowpiercer is Leighton's train. Wilfred's train is the big one for now. Yeah. That, that, I feel that, like we have to good. go yeah, with that. That sounds good. Snowpiercer. Because that's, I mean, even Leighton is still calling his train Snowpiercer. 
He is, you know? yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I think we're good with that. Snowpiercer and Wilford's train, or however we decide to. Uh, yeah, to... we'll just keep. Maybe we end up changing it every week because they <laughs> they give us a better suggestion on what we should be calling it. <laughs> I was just thinking that every week we'll we'll change it up a little bit. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. I don't know where we're at, but I think we're to you. All right. Well, I want to bring up a little bit about Javi. I know we mentioned him just a little bit earlier. I just want to say that the train going by and Javi realizing that they are still alive, I, that was the most life I had really seen out of him this entire time, even though he trucked it all the way back to first class to deal with the EMP. And he went back again and talked to Ruth. Seeing him when that train went by and he realized they were still alive. I think the old Javi's in there and I feel like they just have to pull him out. I think he's just been in shock for things that have happened to him. And you know how Wilford can be. I don't know what else Wilford could have done to him too. I mean, there could be things that we haven't seen. But that was the most I saw out of him that reminded me that Javi was a fun character before all of this happened to him. And it's been really depressing to watch him the last couple of, you know, these first two episodes be like that because one, we thought he might be dead and now it's like he's alive, but his life is just not... Yeah, it's I, just a very sad existence. I also, I, I I hate to laugh laugh about it, but the the dog's reaction was was cracking me up <laughs> when because he was like, he's like doing this number with his head and his eyes, and I don't I'm, I'm sure it was all probably CGI and stuff, but it was just it, the dog was cracking me up in way his. But I, I know I'm totally agree with it. It looked like Javi came to life, and I think the dog realized that too that something had changed in Javi. And so it was, I, I'm going to, I'm excited to see where that comes from and where that goes. Cause you know, he knows, Oh, the people who are on my side, cause remember, like you said, he's really not had any connection with the resistance. He's all he's had is Wilford, you know, putting cream on his face. Oh. Are we going to get a creepy thing every episode? Is that, is that, I think so. I think we should just prepare ourselves for, <laughs> The creep factor. I mean, I thought it was creepy enough that we got tub time with Wilfred at the start of the episode. Tub so time to get the Wilfred. whole ball grabbing piece, it was kind of like, oh, yeah, I really need to unsee this because it was just, it was another bit of him showing how assertive he is and how in control of the situation that he is. He knows exactly what to do to assert his control and that's just uh and uh I, you know i think at the end as much as he seemed to be in control yelling you know battle stations and but i think he i don't think he realizes how much there is a resistance and how many i think he's he's going to see quite a bit of resistance hopefully hopefully anyway uh, well because pike was yelling at the same time mm -hmm. it's like you know they're, they're back, here they're, back. they're alive they're back I think Wilfred thinks he's going to have this big army and I don't think he's going to have as many people as he thinks. I I really don't because he's mistreated a lot of the people by sending them to the compost. So, yeah, I don't know. So my next one is what I've been alluding to this whole time is, is, is so in, in the first episode, we, we basically had a, a, a main story point of, getting them back, getting Ben back to Snowpiercer. That was our main mm -hmm. point. But in the first episode, there's this, it's a very quick exchange, something about losing contact with the satellites. And, yes. And then uh, Leighton sees the vision of the tree when he's almost dying of frostbite, right? Or, or whatever. Uh, um, hypothermia. hypothermia. Yeah. Or he, he's freezing to death, yeah. basically. Yeah. And so then in this episode, we get the next two kind of links to that where 
Javi starts talking about the satellites are going to start falling out of the sky. So I think this is one of our serialized kind of long range plot things is going to be these satellites. And I have a vision of like the last episode of just all sorts of satellites falling from the, from the sky. And like that being, that's going to be a big issue for the next season is that, um, but then we also have this vision of this tree and Leighton goes and researches it mm-hmm. and he finds out that it's, uh, I don't, uh, what did he call it? The blood dragon tree? Uh, dragon's blood dragon's tree. blood tree. Thank you. My dyslexia kicked in there. Um, the dragon's blood tree, which he says he didn't know anything about, but it only grows yes. in this area where they're going, where they think there's a warm spot. And I, I just love that. Yeah. That's, that he went. And the Arabian it. warming spot is what they called it. Yeah. Yeah. And Till, yeah. Till tries to convince him that, no, you probably just read about it in high school or something like that. But I think these are our two kind of overreaching uh, big sub subplots that are going to go throughout uh, the rest of this season. And we're going to finally see, hopefully uh, see t- at the end. I don't expect us to get to this warm spot until towards the end of the season. I, I can't see them. Right. It. I don't think so either. I think that we'll get to it. Maybe episodes eight or nine. Cause we have a lot more going on before then the satellites dropping reminded me of the one that dropped on the walking dead. Created a whole manner of problems yes, exactly. for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But and- um, yeah, that reminded me of that situation i think too they were worried about the satellites because they weren't it was going to keep them from being able to figure out where wilford was right right and that was and that was resolved for them at the end by the emp exploding in such Ugh, a huge who knew? fashion which which i just absolutely love but yeah it's it, it's it's interesting because that conversation that javi and not javi that ben and alex have about the satellites um, we don't really hear the end of that. She just kind of sets down and it just kind of mm-hmm. gets dropped. So I, I'm excited to, that I started to pick up on that. I'm like, I'm going to start watching for that every every episode. I'm going to start looking for, okay, what what little bit more are we going to get about the tree? What little bit more are we going to get about the Arabian warming spot? Uh, and what more are we going to get about the satellites? Because, you know, they also use the satellites to find those warm spots. So yeah. how is that going to affect us going forward? Yeah, because we only, all we know is what Leighton envisioned, and then he went to the library, which makes, is a reason why, it's a reason why I believe that we can't, they can't just disregard the rest of that. They need those cars because they need the library. They can't really go to Google and start searching. That doesn't happen. <laughs> That's not happening. So I somebody's going like to the, gotta go to the card catalog and, and <laughs> yeah yeah there's a lot yeah they need that library i also thought it was interesting if you noticed audrey's reaction like it just it made me question just the littlest bit that if there is hope for life out there that maybe she might snap back into herself because i think part of the reason why she could have been back with Wilford is because she had no hope of anything else and thinking that nothing was ever going to change. And That's it was good. a somewhat comfortable situation that she, she yeah. wanted to be at the top of the food chain and she didn't think it was going to get any better. So this was what she was going to have. I forgot about that. So yeah, I she just, was, yeah. she was asking Leighton a bunch of questions, not only about Asha, but she was asking him questions about what he saw and what was he looking for and can I help? And, so yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe we'll start to see something of her trying. To I come don't know. Back. Is Audrey still in there? We'll see. I don't know. Hopefully, <laughs> I'm not sure where we are. We maybe at your number one. Yes. Well, my number one we've talked a little bit about already. It's it's basically the EMP and Layton's victories in this episode because that EMP which we've talked about a little bit, they were testing it with like a 10% volt through the train, which is what everyone had felt. And I was trying to think, what is he going to do with that? And then the, the question was answered. He was going to take that EMP and basically fry everything on Snowpiercer. Yeah, he was going to stop. Taking latent. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, taking Leighton out of it, like eliminating Leighton as a threat. Um, yeah, I've got it. Actually, I've got the quote right here from Javi. It's going to stop Leighton dead. I have to get back to the dog. Yes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, uh, Why does he have to get back to the dog? I don't I, understand that. I love how they kind of figured out what it was and then went to go take it apart. Because this was my number one. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Pike went to get lights. And expected her to disarm it. And I'm thinking, poor lights. To expect her to know how to disarm an EMP is crazy. <laughs> yeah. What in her background? I mean, I know she's done some technical things, but like, <laughs> this is a super yeah. technical thing. Um, but I, I did. It was on my second watch. I didn't realize on the first watch that it was Pike who he yanked something out. And that's what started the countdown. Because <laughs> yeah, you know, two minutes. Lights is, lights is like, no, don't do that. And then he just does it or she's like wait what are you doing and he just <laughs> and uh yep but i did i i will again like i said this was my number one as well so i i, I love that we that we're talking about it um it did get a little anticlimactic though that that they're like that he's like well let's just get rid of it and she, well can you open a door and then i loved again it's one of those things that we we're getting a little bit of history here because didn't he say in the second uh second Re- revolt yeah the yeah. second revolt when they put us down they put us down but we were able to weaken the hinges of the mm-hmm. of the doors and then we get strong boy back and we haven't seen strong boy yet this I'm season in a little bit yeah so, so i loved seeing strong boy there and and uh him pushing that that thing and then basically all they do is you just push it out the back door <laughs> yeah of the train and he's like run <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> run get out of here run yes but the cool thing about that was the after effect that ha- that it actually gave Leighton and his team the location of where Wilford and the rest of the train is so they could surprise I you, you know it was the element of surprise and even though you know Wilford wants to get rid of them he likes Leighton because he's a worthy adversary. He's a worthy adversary. Yeah, and I love the way they just showed up. Like you said, it was it was because mm-hmm. even Till says it when they they said something about okay, so now we know where they are, but they don't know where we are, and so right. they were able to just slide right up on yep. the side of them. And uh, again, I, I it's kind of interesting that there are parallel tracks, but I guess you would you would build it that way in case you ever did have to, because you did, he did build it with two trains in mind, you know, yeah. originally. So it would, it would make sense that there's two sets of tracks right next to each other. Uh, but that was such and a Wilfred, cool. I love that visual, right? That was so cool. And Wilford, um, and Leighton even said, you know, he had a choice. What do you do? Do you go on the main track or the parallel track? And he chose the parallel track because of more options. Yeah, I didn't understand that the first time, but the second time listening to it, I went, oh, okay, now I understand. So they'll be on the parallel track and maybe they're going to try to cross, like if they can match speed and they they can try to cross over, jump over and and, and get, and we might see some train jumping, which would be kind of cool to see if that, that happens. There's a lot of potential there. There's a lot of potential I did watch the sneak preview for next week. I'm not going to dive into it. I do think we're going to get, I will mention this. I do think that the showdown between Leighton Wilford is coming sooner rather than later. Not sure if it's next episode or not, but I can, I think it's coming. And I'm, I think Leighton has more leverage than he thought he had. Yeah, I think especially now that they know they're alive, because remember in the first episode, Pike and and some of the others, they said Leighton abandoned them. They thought he had just run off with his own train and been like, okay, they're off doing their own thing. Because they also didn't realize that Wilford was tracking them and was, was but I love that. Some of the, what we didn't talk about yet is, is Alex talking to Ben and saying, well, yeah, it's a no, basically it's a no brainer that obviously he's, he's chasing us. Like, why would yeah. he not be chasing us? <laughs> he wants his train back. <laughs> he wants he, he wants control and he wants his people. So, uh, yeah. Of course. I, he wants to find out how Audrey is. And, again, that's one of those uh, uh, impressive things because it means that Wilford knows how decent Leighton is. He knows that Leighton is not going to mistreat Audrey. Audrey. And he, He's not. And, like you said, there's a there's it's a weird it's a weird respect 
I, I think mm-hmm. I, I totally agree. With you. Weird respect because in the last episode, Wilford said it. He said, I have to keep everyone alive because I made a deal. I made a deal to keep Audrey alive, to keep Zara alive. Um, and that's where we're at. And, and so there's that, like you said, there's that, that respect between the two of them that I think is, is so cool. And it's going to be interesting to see. Yeah. Going forward. How it all breaks down. How it all breaks I'm down. I'm not sure. I'm really excited, but I'm nervous. The show has shown that they, while they have kept people alive when you think that they're dead, they also will kill people off. So I'm, mm, I don't know. I I think we have a lot of characters. <laughs> we have a lot of characters and we're going to see, I, I, I think we're, you know, we almost saw a limb get taken off in this episode. But yeah. It, we haven't even talked about that. I feel like that enough happened in this episode that that's in my notes. It's it's in my notes. I mean, as that well. tells you something. It tells you. Mm. Um, in fact, that I think is the only note I have that we haven't already discussed so uh, why don't we get to it then because i have a couple of things about it too okay um well the, my note is wilford says that he never intended to use the ports he put them in never intending i don't believe that for a second neither do i he is so sadistic that i can't imagine him not doing it but calling her out on the number of times that she has used it what was it 13 that was 13 times yeah. she has used the portal. And she she was so tough in this episode. Like she's like, "Okay, do it. Finish it. Get it, do away, you know, let's move on." Yeah, he's what She he is say? not I'm... that person that we had at the beginning of this series. Oh she no, is she has grown. She has so, grown so much. She has grown so much. She yeah, really what did he, he said something about, I'm going to make sure they put the, the coupling high enough so you can't wear a prosthetic. And she's like, I wouldn't wear one anyway. I was just, oh, I know. and like her, just, just get the bloody thing off, you know, was, I was, and just do it. I was just so impressed. And that was just that, that power of, of, cause she's not going to let him break her. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to break her and she's not going to, he does. Her. And she's not going to allow it. Because he's, for his first interaction with her, her response is, well, I do try not to disappoint. And then we're getting a little bit into my quotes here, but I feel like we have to. We do. Her response to him was, loyalty has to come with love, not the kind you feed off of. Unconditional love, sacrifice for each and every passenger. You can't ignore love. You can't predict it either. And she's so honest with him at that point, and she's got nothing to lose. She's given everything of herself for the train. And that is the one thing that I don't think has changed in her character this entire time, is when she was started right from the beginning, she was always taking care of the passengers and trying to do what was best for the train. That was always at the forefront of her mind. And now she's ready to make a sacrifice. She made sacrifices in this episode. She gave herself up for the good of the train in hoping that strong boy Pike and Lights could disarm or get rid of the EMP. Now, getting rid of it was a better idea anyway. It needed to go because yeah, then he can't use it. Right. I forgot to mention this in my, in my point, but I thought it was, it was really cool that Kevin, you know, Kev, they decide to use the wedding as a distraction so they can go deal with the EMP. Kevin figures it out because he sees Javi, but then she kind of reverses it and she's like, well, I'll be the distraction because once they find me, they'll stop looking for anybody, anybody else. And I was, I was almost kind of surprised that Kevin didn't like, okay, take her away. We're going to keep searching kind of thing. Right. Um, I mean, I was glad he didn't. And, and for the story, it was, it was good that he didn't, but I was, it was almost one of those things where I was, I, I almost kind of wished that Kevin had gone, no, you're trying to distract us from something, you know, but. Uh, well, me- if you think, if you think about it, she, Javi basically s- said, you're not on the other train, which we realized no one knew that she was, she was right. still on Wilford's train. 
So for Kevin to come in, she knew if she gave herself up, they wouldn't look, they'd be, he'd be shocked that it was her. Right. And he'd want to get her to Wilford as quickly yes. as possible because he wants to show, I mean, he wants, to, he wants to get the approval. He wants to get yes. all of that. So I, okay. I can see it. I can see it that he, but it just, I thought yeah. it was really cool that she even says it. She says, I'll be the distraction so that you guys can take care of this, this problem, you know, which, and then she puts Pike in charge. I mean, she's like, you're in Ugh. charge now, Pike. And I was just like, oh. has he grown enough to be able to wear the crown? We'll I'm see. not sure, but I'm hopeful. I mean, it, it because looks I like feel it. like he, he, yeah, he, it seems like he has already so I'm kind of like, Oh, please, please Pike be the person we know you can be and lead because I don't know. The next episode. I want him to prove me wrong and I want him to do a good job. But now that Leighton is back, maybe we'll get what we are looking for. I'm not sure. We'll see. We'll it's see. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, let's see. Uh, the, the the first quote that I have. Oh, I'm sorry. Was that all your notes or have you got more? Um, the only other thing that I wanted to say is the dance, the first dance song for LJ and Oz was called Apocalypse by Cigarettes After Sex. And I thought it was an interesting song. And I think the lyrics kind of fit with what's going on. So yeah, I just wanted to, to point that out. Um, and I also, there was one other thing that took place during the ceremony. I just kind of wanted to say, this is what Wilford said that, you know, when you get married, there are vows that you say. Wilford's are a bit twisted. I mean, he's always talking about loyalty to him and, and vice, you know, that focus. But he said, now I ask you to take the sacred steps in union with the eternal engine. These four steps represent the path humanity has taken from grass to ice, ice to steel, and from steel to the light of the eternal engine. Somehow, I think those words would have been okay, except with him saying them, it just brought a whole new meaning to the table. It, it's just creepy. And yeah. Yeah. It reminded he, me, he's... It, it reminded me a little bit of the, the Ed Harris, the way Ed Harris played the character in the movie of actually yes. thinking of himself as a God. You know, yes. who has, who has done this. And that's, and that's what, and that's what he did in this ceremony was he put himself, I mean, he made that ceremony more about him than them. Yes, absolutely. And his train. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for sure. Agreed. For sure. Yeah. Uh, so that's all I have. The, uh, the only, I've got a couple of quotes here that we haven't already discussed. Um, we talked about the diamond. It's the biggest diamond left in the world. And all I, all it cost me was a pair of heavy socks. So I thought that was kind of a cool uh, quote, what was one of yours? Um, I have. <laughs> when Zara tells Pike that Javi isn't the same after the dog attack, Pike responds with, well, we all got scars. Very like, good. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the only other one I have that we haven't talked about was when Leighton is talking to Asha uh, there towards, I think it's towards the end. And uh, she says, you pushed past what was safe, even sane to rescue me. Why? And Leighton responds with, I'm glad I did. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's just a cool way of, of not answering the question, <laughs> but still, of saying, course, I'm glad I did. You know, I don't know why I did it. I just did it. So, yeah. Any other quotes? Nope. That's all I had for this episode. We, I kind of said some of them while we were talking about the situations. So yeah, that was all I have. Uh, I did not see any feedback and I didn't check email. So I will definitely make sure to check email next week before I didn't see anything yesterday in the email. Um, so, but I, I didn't check today. I didn't have time. So, uh, and I haven't seen any other notifications of feedback. Uh, but as always, we would appreciate any feedback you could, you can send us. Uh, we will definitely read it and definitely, uh, love to hear it. Uh, podcast recommendations. I can only recommend my friend 
and co-host Paik and his co-host Rima. They're coming back with Strange Indeed this week to talk about You Season 3. So that should be out, I think, later this week. It's a show I've never seen, but I feel like I might have to watch it because I love listening to them on the podcast. It's a it's a great show. I I went I was right with them the first two seasons, um, or with I guess Sean and 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 she uh, for the first two seasons. I don't know with doing double duty uh, with The Witcher and uh, Snowpiercer. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to. I may have to. Uh, do, I don't know. I have to come back late uh, to my message from earlier this week and said, look, I'm just, I don't know if I'm going to have time, uh, but I'll, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> uh, but I do. Uh, you is a, I think you would like it. It's a, yeah, it's a good, it's good. It's, it's, it's a weird kind of twisty show. And uh, the, the first season was, uh, was really good. And then the second season just amped it up and I'm excited to see what this third season is going to bring it. Uh, House Podcastica is finishing up their Cobra Kai. I think they just uh, a couple days ago released their final their their season finale episode that covered the last two episodes of this season of Cobra Kai. So uh, check out House Podcastica as well. Yeah, I think they're also covering the Book of Boba Fett. Oh yes, that's right. And I am able to well. send them. I am sending them voicemails for that because I the the way that drops Book of Boba Fett drops on Wednesday. So if I can get it get it quick in there Wednesday. I can uh, send them a quick voicemail uh, for that one. So, uh, but you is another, you is a whole nother ball game with that one. <laughs> uh, well, as always, you are listening to us on your podcast player of choice, uh, whatever we are available on all the, the platforms that are out there. Please check us out. Panels to pixels podcast. Our website is panels to pixels podcast.com. As always, we are on Facebook facebook.com slash panels to pixels. We are on Twitter at panels to pixels. That's panels, the number two and pixels. We have an email address, which is panels to pixels one at gmail.com panels to pixels one. The TO is spelled out right there in the middle. The number one at gmail.com. I feel like I say the same thing every week. I should just record it and find some way to drop <laughs> it in here. But no, we also have a YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel is Panels to Pixels Podcast. We are on Instagram at Panels to Pixels Podcast, all spelled out. Uh, give us a follow there. Uh, send us a message on Instagram. I've seen a couple of you follow us on Instagram, and I appreciate that. Uh, uh, and I send out a post every week on Instagram and Facebook asking uh, for feedback. Next week, the third episode entitled The First Blow. I did not read the oh synopsis boy. on it, but I no. can imagine there's going to be many blows afterwards. <laughs> yeah, I'm really curious as to where we're going with that. They definitely don't give us enough information in a title, but they give you a little tip. You just never really know where it is going to connect. If it's going to be literal or if it's going to be figurative i mean it's it's hard to gauge sometimes we had no idea last week that the last to go was going to be the emp so yeah out the door uh, bye bye uh so this first blow <laughs> we'll see we'll see what it is uh well what about Absolutely. you Daphne? what uh, what are you and pick up to this week on run for your lives well this week we're not releasing an episode things got a little bit crazy um Pake went on vacation i've had some things going on as well so we decided to take a week off, but we'll be back next week with a new episode on Fridays, as usual. I usually drop it at 9 a.m. on a Friday morning, so it's available for people to listen to on the weekend. Um, our most recent episode is Antlers, and that was released last Friday. Such a confusing I movie. know, Steve. <laughs> How many times did I say, I don't know what's going on? <laughs> Many times. In that live scene. So what movie uh, will you be covering next week, though? Uh, next week, we're going to be covering a little movie called, um, oh my gosh, Little Monsters. Little Mon Oh, that's right. We talked about this last week. It's the not the not the 80s Little Monsters. No. Uh, this 2019. Is 2019 one. And I've, I've uh, mysteriously got a couple days off here in the middle of the week uh, that I may uh, try to, to fit that in uh, to my I schedule. I think you should, Steve, did you like, did you watch Cooties? Yes, but that was one of those ones when I, I, I have tried to um, imbibe less uh, when I'm doing a live Steve now. Cooties was when I was imbibing more during a live Steve. Okay. And I think that one got 
way incoherent towards the end of it. I think you might enjoy uh, Little Monsters. This one. I will I will try I to do. check it out. Like I said, I've got a couple of days here that I'm going to be uh, kind of stuck inside. So I will uh, uh, check it out and see what I can do. Uh, but I think that you'll, yeah, I think you'll like this one. I think it's fun. It's kind of like Cooties. It's... It's kind of like Black Sheep. It's just, it's got a fun vibe to it. Okay. It's an Australian movie. It It's fun. All right. I will check it out. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> I think it's on Hulu. I think we talked about that last week. It's like on Hulu or something. Yes, it's on it's one on of the Hulu. platforms that I have. So uh, very, very yeah. cool. Well, thank you listeners for joining us on this week's podcast of uh, Snowpiercer season three, episode two. I have been Steve. And I'm Daphne. I don't know why I just said it that way. Uh, but this is Panels to Pixels, and we will see you on the next panel.